<laughs> Good morning, Highline College. Buenos dias. My name is Doris Martinez. She, her, her pronouns. And I serve as a member of this year's Unity Through Diversity Planning Committee. Uh, before we begin today's program, I would love to uh, present our land and labor acknowledgement. We take a moment to acknowledge all indigenous and first people of the land and space in which we live and breathe. For our community here at Highline College, we recognize that we are on stolen and occupied Duwamish, Coast Salish, Muckleshoot, and Puyallup lands. And we wanna thank all relations and tribes today as we prepare to hold space as a community. We recognize that all of us are joining this conversation from different locations through Zoom. And so let us also acknowledge all the indigenous and first people of the land and spaces in which you currently occupy. Further, we respectfully acknowledge the enslaved people, primarily of African descent, and prov uh, who provided and exploited labor on which this country was built with little to no recognition. Today, we are indebted to their labor and the labor of many black and brown bodies that continue to work in the shadows of our collective benefit. And now I will pass the virtual mic to my family, Dr. Bryce, who will introduce today's feature presenter. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doris. And welcome everybody. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. He is no stranger to Highline. His name is Dr. Derek Brooms. He is Professor of Africana Studies and Sociology, a faculty affiliate in Women, Gender and Sexualities program, and a fellow with the Center for the Study for Social Justice at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And he serves as a youth worker as well. His research primarily focuses on the lived experiences of Black boys and men, including representation in the media and identity development, as well as their paths to and through college. Dr. Broom also explores Black men and boys' sense of self, and sense making and navigating various social institutions. He is the author of several books, including Stakes is High, Lessons, Trials and Triumphs and Young Black Men's Educational Journeys and Being Black, Being Male on Campus, Understanding and Confronting Black Male Collegiate Experiences. He also serves as founding editor of the Critical Race Studies and Education book series with SUNY Press. And on top of all of that, he finds time to mentor and serves as a big brother to folks like me and many others in the community. So with that, I will turn the mic over to Dr. Derek Burns. Greetings, greetings. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, giving thanks to uh, my brother and colleague, Dr. Daryl Bryce for the introduction. And as we get started here, um, before I share my slides, uh, I wanted to give acknowledgments as well. Thank you, Doris Martinez, for the land acknowledgments and the welcome for all who are joining us here today. I wanna to give my sincere thanks to the Center for Cultural and Inclusive Excellence at Highline College um, for the invitation to join this year's 25th annual Unity Through Diversity Week. And also wanna give thanks to the planning committee in particular, just a few names, I know this is not uh, encompass all folks, uh, but Edwina Fui served as the chair, Daryl Bryce, as I mentioned, Doris Martinez, Monica Twerk, and Beatrice Vedar. So I wanted to give uh, thank you before I even pull up uh, my work, just as a way to acknowledge all the folks who are doing this work, um, including uh, folks on staff as well. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and I'll get it all up and going here. And my screen should be up. As mentioned, 25th Annual Uni Unity Through Diversity Week. And one of the things that I wanted to acknowledge right here as we begin is that it takes a bit of intentionality and commitment to carry on a tradition um, that has lasted for two and a half decades. So as I think about the work that's being done at Highline College, and in particular, uh, the Multicultural Student Affairs, uh, the C. CIE and other entities across the institution, uh, I think it's important that we recognize uh, this work, this steadfast effort. And I also want to just acknowledge uh, for those folks who might be the first event that they've attended for this year's uh, Unity Through Diversity Week, um, the main title, the main theme of this year's uh, week is Lean On Me. Uh, and so we got some of the music planned there, folks who had joined uh, at the time when we had some of the music planned. And so what I want to do uh, today as I begin is to offer what I call a 
panoramic view on the one hand, um, or take you through what I might call 10 scenes and making sense of the lives and experiences of black boys and men. And as Dr. Bryce mentioned, most of my work primarily looks at the lived experiences and educational experiences of black boys and men, um, particularly their pathways to and through college. So I really pay attention to secondary school years and then how are they trying to pursue and access higher education and what does that look like in their uh, experiences? So that's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, I'm very much interested in racial justice as it relates to black men and boys. Um, and in that realm, I think about and, and, and do work that relates to uh, stereotype and profile and uh, racism and unfortunately uh, the realities of you know, violence against black boys and men and in particular uh, police violence or interpersonal violence in the ways in which uh, their lives have been cut short. And so, as I mentioned, I wanted to take you through 10 scenes uh, that I want to present my work through today. And as I begin, before I jump into that, uh, I also wanted to provide a little bit of positionality. And so I'm from the south side of Chicago. And I always share where I'm from because uh, part of that is it informs my own positionality. It also informs my own uh, uh, experiential knowledge and, as well as my epistemology. And so I always acknowledge where I'm from because it helped shape the particular worldview that I navigate the world in um, and make sense of my own life world. Uh, I am an educator. Uh, I'm a writer slash scholar, depending on who you talk to, uh, author. Um, I'm a community member, right? I'm a family member. Uh, I also work in the community in ways that connects to young people's lives. And so I think about the youth work that I engage in um, and by youth, you know, these are folks, I would say, probably up to 22, 24 years of age, which would mean that it encompasses, if you will, the traditionally aged uh, college community folk as well, um, across different race and ethnic backgrounds, across di different gender uh, identities, expressions, um, et cetera. And so I offer my positionality because, it, you know, I bring all of myself to this work, uh, my, my, along with my brilliant and distinguished friend and colleague, Jaleesa Clark, one of the things we, we kind of conceptualize is this unapologetic black inquiry. And that is that it makes no sense to us where we would want to, in, in trying to make sense of black people's lives, lived experiences, education, et cetera, that then we would want to filter our understanding through the lens or adjusted position of somebody else. Uh, part of what we argue, and this is what I wholly embrace in my work is that uh, we are who we are. We don't need to compare ourselves to others. Let us make sense of who we are through our very real heterogeneous communities, plural, um, that includes the, the, the diaspora, um, includes the U.S. born Black folk, um, includes the different ways in which we are connected and expanded in our community connections, family connections, et cetera. And so my positionality is one that uh, does not apologize at all for uh, a hyper focus on uh, Black folk, Black communities, Black families, Black lived experiences, uh, primarily because I'm also learning even more about myself, my family, my community, or communities, et cetera. So I wanted to begin with a little bit of background about myself um, as we begin to explore. And so what I wanna do is take you on a tour. As I mentioned, I have 10 scenes. Uh, some of these may be familiar to some folks. Some of these may be a little bit distant for some other folks, or some of these may be new uh, for even another set of folks. But I wanna use these scenes as a way to tap into your own kind of cultural repertoire, your cultural toolkit, uh, your frames of understanding to help you see that even as I speak through a research informed lens, uh, what I really am trying to present as a wider corpus and a wider perspective of uh, the lives and experiences of black boys and men. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get going. And so partially what I wanna do is talk about navigating the stakes. And of course, in order to talk about navigating the stakes, um, part of what I wanna do is, you know, even at least briefly is explicate and make sure that I'm clear on what are some of the stakes. And so in this first half of the talk, I wanna uh, share what some of these stakes are. Uh, and by scenes, overwhelmingly, uh, what I'm presenting are movie scenes. Um, and so this is the first one that I use to really ground uh, what I'm presenting today, and this is, of course, Chiron from the movie Moonlight, um, and this is a particular scene from uh, being at school. 
But the scene is so much more than that. Uh, there is some, you know, representation with regards to looking out at a fence and the things that that might uh, elicit in terms of our own kind of social memories or uh, community memories. Uh, so I'm thinking about the ways in which uh, there are social institutions within this nation uh, where Black folks in general, uh, but I'm going to specifically focus on Black boys and men, uh, experience multiple forms of suffering, right? And school is no exception to that, right? So in, in some ways, our schools are sites of suffering or create these higher stakes for Black boys to navigate. And, and here, I'm particularly thinking about that pre-K through uh, 12 uh, spectrum. But we also have community concerns, right? So there are a number of ways in which uh, Black boys and men are troubled, challenged um, within the communities in which they live. Uh, this includes the ways in which they try to navigate peer associations and peer relationships. Uh, so in some of my work, I've talked about things like navigating the neighborhood, um, the ways in which some Black boys um, particularly uh, think about not letting what they call, this is their terminology, not letting the neighborhood win. And by that, this is not and at all a critique of the people who live in the neighborhood, but in effect, uh, one of the stakes that Black boys and men really have to try to navigate is the conditions of the neighborhood, right? So what does it mean to live in some of our urban environments that are economically deprived, um, that are, you know, uh, short on resources, et cetera? So this is not, again, a commentary about the people who live there, but even the strategies that they might have to engage in uh, to navigate the structural violence of these particular uh, entities, these communities, these communal spaces, et cetera. So when they talk about not letting the neighborhood win, um, they're talking about trying to navigate particular types of elements. And then the third uh, lens, uh, two other lenses, if you will, the third one is um, the criminal justice system. So again, I mentioned the social institutions and I'll say a little bit more about the criminal justice system in a, in a few moments here. And then the fourth one, again, I'll reference this again a bit later is the media. So when we think about what are the stakes uh, that Black boys and men are trying to navigate, it is the already assumed knowledge that people try to project against them as it relates to already knowing who they are, potentially on the one hand, and at the same time, rendering them as marginal, um, as, you know, as denigrated, uh, as disposable. So how then do Black boys and men not only learn of these particular framings and projections, but how, how do they also develop strategies to try to navigate them? And so um, I begin here with Chiron very intentionally um, because of his lived experiences that also includes uh, aspects about his identity, race, gender, sexuality, et cetera, that he's trying to make sense of where does he fit in the world? And of course, I'll invoke, uh, or, or I'll invoke uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's critical inquiry, how does it feel to be a problem? And so for many Black boys and men, they are always already labeled and positioned as problems, regardless of where they are, whether it's their own neighborhoods, whether it's a neighboring uh, community, whether it's on college campuses, whether it's across P through 12 uh, education systems, Etc. they are already considered as this problem that needs to be surveilled, hyper-policed. And so these then uh, make navigating these particular types of spaces, but also trying to make sense of who you are, where you are, and whose you are a bit more challenging. So let us move forward here. And I wanted to, just to, in a few instances, I've sprinkled in a couple of quotes uh, from some of my work to really bring to life um, some of the narratives that some boys, you know, mostly young men and men, uh, have offered to me through, you know, a couple of sets of uh, research projects that I'm bringing together here. So uh, I'm, I'm starting with this notion that stakes is high. And I'll begin with this uh, lyric from uh, hip hop artist Joey Badass on his uh, album, All American. And he says, my brother's under a spell. It's clear we're living in hell, the life of a black male. Right out of the womb, you come out and it's a bunch of black male just waiting for you to fail a special room in the jail. And so here we also see this uh, notions of the stakes, the challenges, the obstacles, the repositioning of black boys and men, uh, you know, infused in hip hop. And I could of course uh, 
connect this to a, a range of other artists and some of the work that they've put out. Um, but I really like, you know, the way Joey Badass has offered it here um, because he's hitting on, again, several of the different ways in which uh, Black boys and men are just repositioned within society, right? There's a overwhelming expectation of failure. Um, there are various ways in which schools uh, engage in both miseducation and educational neglect. Um, and so Joey Badass kind of offers that for us here. Uh, here's Chris uh, sharing about a particular experience he had in the neighborhood that he lived in and, and was going to school in, uh, or he was going to school in and, uh, and lived in a neighboring community. He talked about, you know, uh, there was a transit employee that he had a particular interaction with. His friend didn't have uh, any money to get home from school. And Chris lent him a, his bus card so that, you know, his friend or associate uh, could get home. And he's reflecting here on this interaction that he had with this public transit employee. And he says, I remember the guy saying I wasn't going to be anything except like those guys who were hanging out on the corner or in gangs. And I said, this is Chris. What do you mean? I have a 3.5 grade point average and I'm about to go to college. And this employee laughed and said, college. Yeah, right. Right. So he rendered Chris's aspirations and actual um, reality as unreasonable, as laughable, as something that isn't, you know, it's not even fathomably possible. Uh, and the important thing here is that because of his association with a particular neighborhood, primarily in this particular case, that his school was just in the neighborhood, uh, this public, you know, public transit uh, employee literally rendered his life as disposable. You're not going to be anything except like those guys who are hanging out or in gangs. And so in many ways, this particular narrative, this particular message says that those guys who are hanging out or in gangs, their lives don't matter. So therefore, your life doesn't matter. It makes me think of my colleague, Roger Carey, who talks about the marginal mattering of uh, Black boys and men. And so here we see this employee who had no idea who Chris was, even as Chris tried to share with him not only his academic uh, performances, but then also his aspirations is still rendered as both impossible and or improbable. Uh, here's Chris responding, you know, I was frustrated. And that was one of those events when I realized that this is what people might think and they didn't even know me. It highlighted to me that black males are seen as statistics and bound by our social conditions. And one of the reasons why I want to also uh, share with the audience here, uh, some of the statements and narratives and experiences and meaning making from some of the young men that I've talked to, uh, it's because I want you to see it through their own words or hear it through their own words as I read it. Um, primarily because one of the arguments I make is that there's a great deal to be learned if we talk to black men and boys themselves. But in fact, uh, we have all utterly failed in those regards. And instead, what we do is talk at them and talk about them. But we very rarely, um, in any meaningful ways, engage with them to learn who they are and learn what they're about. Because again, we already have a narrative and a projection and a, and a position that we think they uh, ought to be in. Here's another short statement by Malink. Uh, I was asking him, you know, in terms of, you know, what did you learn about being black, uh, being a black man from, you know, your schooling years, your education, your college? He says, uh, he had a longer quote, I kind of narrowed it down here. He says, I think about all the scrutiny we get from being a black man from everyday situations and things like that. He talked about, you know, where, the, where you go in a restaurant, whether you're approaching the ATM, whether you're just on a college campus, you know, just all these everyday situations. That makes it hard to be a black man in society. People aren't letting go of what they see in the media or TV and they don't give us a chance to be us. And here, I just wanna hone in on this last portion, right? This notion that there are others who don't even allow black boys and men to be who they are on the one hand and at the same time, they also then in many ways uh, are working to deny and marginalize their future selves, right? And so these are some of these stakes uh, or some of these uh, ways in which I argue that stakes is high. Here's my second scene uh, pulled from, of course, the iconic movie, Boys in the Hood uh, with Ricky, Trey and Doughboy. And part of what I use for this particular uh, image is to kind of reiterate the points that I raised about these kind of neighborhood effects. What does it mean to live in particular neighborhoods um, that elicit particular types of challenges that you try to navigate, um, again, that connects to your peer relationships or associations. 
and what that might mean for your lived experiences, life outcomes, trajectory, pathways, et cetera. Um, there are multiple elements in this film that I could pretty much do a whole and, and unpack a whole kind of talk, if you will, or, or engagement um, with this film. But for me, uh, one of the things that I really wanted to articulate and, and really bring to bear is uh, even within our neighborhoods, there are particular challenges that we are faced with um, in, this, in this particular case, uh, it might be gang affiliations, right? So gonna give a few more uh, statements here from some of the guys talking about these kind of neighborhood effects that they were trying to navigate. Um, here's Tyson talking about navigating the neighborhood. It was tough, it was difficult. It was just a tough neighborhood. Everybody don't make it out. You have those that make it out, they come back and don't make it out again. And you have those that make it out and don't ever come back. And so part of what he's talking about here is some of the tension and conflict that some of our youth face with regards to staying and being connected with their home environment, their home neighborhood, and what that might mean for their very real, as uh, Malik put it, everyday situation, right? And so here's Tyson trying to make sense of uh, what the neighborhood, the messages uh, might mean for some of our young folk, particularly black boys. Uh, here's another statement from Dwayne. He says, you know, navigating the neighborhood, I had to look over my shoulder walking. I couldn't just walk and only look straight ahead. I had to be aware. I had to watch and listen because anything could happen. It's an unpredictable place, this particular neighborhood, uh, even though the issues were predictable, right? Again, some of these issues were economic depravity, which then contributes to uh, the violence of poverty, which of course then uh, creates particular type of conditions where folks are in survival mode, which is fertile ground for perhaps some of the illegal and illicit activities that happens in that neighborhood. So in that sense, what Dwayne is referring to, those uh, behaviors become predictable because of the conditions that people are faced with, challenged with, um, and then they're trying to navigate those. And then here's uh, Malik uh, it says, I think, you know, it had this particular neighborhood with all the negativity going on. It had a positive impact on me. I saw the violence and all the negative stuff going on in my mind. I knew I didn't want anything to do with it. I tried to get the best grades, obviously speaking educationally, uh, school performance that I could and get to college and get away. And so here we see some of the young men, Malik in particular, uh, but this is re this resonates with others. Uh, talking about how they use these particular elements of their lives, right, these lived experiences as opportunities for uh, what I call and talk about borrowing from uh, Merz's work, uh, these educational desires, right? So took these challenges, transformed them, if you will, as aspiration, as motivation um, that informed part of, you know, a good portion of what it was that they tried to do. So um, even as they... Uh, identify the stakes, we also see some of the ways that they're trying to navigate some of these, these critical decisions that they're making. This is a scene from the movie Minister Society. Uh, so this is scene number three. Uh, I won't go into great detail um, and I wanted to be mindful of not you know, uh, placating to black death um, because again, in the past, I would say five to 10 years what we've seen go viral uh, we can go all the way back to the killing of uh, Oscar Grant in 2009. And of course, we could think more recently, um, and I'll talk about that in just a bit. And so I want to be mindful of the images that I present. And so here, I'm again, borrowing from a movie scene, uh, not because I have a fascination and fixation on Black death or Black male death, uh, but part of what I want to talk about is even within the particular neighborhood dynamic, there are ways in which uh, uh, over-policing, hyper-policing, hyper-surveillance kind of condemns their lives again, uh, I'll use this word again, as disposable, as marginalized, as unworthy, right? And so this particular scene from that film really kind of resonates with some of, you know, an additional layer of challenges where the criminal justice system, state-sanctioned authorities uh, can levy uh, their weight against some, you know, some of our community members, again, across race, ethnic backgrounds, and gender uh, identities, et cetera. Uh, and so I just evoke this image to uh, really highlight uh, kind of what Victor Rios talks about, that hyper-criminalization of our youth in particular, uh, Black and Latino. Uh, but of course here, my focus is on uh, black, black boys and men. And again, um, I, could, I could choose a number of different images. I'm just choosing one. 
Um, and I'm choosing this one for a number of different reasons. Uh, and I'll be uh, pretty, I try to be pretty succinct here. Number one, that this just past February was the 10th year anniversary of the killing of Trayvon Martin. So he was killed in February of 2012. Um, so this is 10, we're 10 years later. And, and for those of us who are familiar with, uh, you know, what transpired, uh, it was basically because Trayvon Marty had on a hoodie in a particular neighborhood uh, that he, again, looked suspicious. And so we can see the correlations between an image such as this, where there's an incident that potentially happened in Trayvon Martin's case, it was not an incident, um, but there's an incident that has happened or reported to have happened and the state can be called as you know, agents to uh, police, surveil, detain, and question folks. And again, I can map this to more recent events. I can think of Amy Cooper in New York City in Central Park where she threatened uh, you know, uh, Cooper, Chris Cooper to blackmail that uh, because he asked her to put her dog on a leash, which is the park rules, uh, she threatened in a response, you know, I'm going to call a police on them and tell them that you're harassing me. And so there are ways in which within this society, as mentioned, uh, that anti-Black violence, particularly in the form of state sanctioned authority um, and weight can be called upon not only to police, but also to punish Black life. Um, and so I just evoke uh, both of these as part of that. But the other reason I also show this image is because uh, we can see that there's a very stark difference in this juxtapositioning of how uh, George Zimmerman on the, my left and Trayvon Martin are both represented in these images. Even, let me make one more quick point, the initial pictures that were actually used to depict Trayvon Martin was actually from the rapper, The Game. And so again, it didn't matter who Trayvon Martin was, any young black male would do, even one who was not a picture of Trayvon Martin. And so there are ways in which their you know, humanity is under constant attack. This picture of Trayvon Martin was actually a picture from five years earlier. Um, so again, it is quite suggestive of how we ought to think about him. Um, and again, as I mentioned from Roger Carey's work, this kind of marginal mattering, right? Uh, but it also evokes these legacies of fear. It also evokes these ways in which we shouldn't really care about these young boys, these young men, because in this particular way, uh, maybe they don't even care about themselves. Uh, so in talking with some men, uh, I've got two longer quotes here, talking with some men about how they making sense of the racial profiling that they might've seen and experienced themselves, racial stereotyping, and also uh, the killing of black boys and men. Again, I wanted to invoke, invoke some of their words uh, so here's Mason, uh, a 35 year old teacher who I talked to. He says, ultimately, I really believe they were killed because of someone else's perception of them. Just because of race, just because of gender, they were automatically threats. Other people were threatened by them. If it hadn't been Trayvon Martin, but it was another black man, he would have been dead. If it wasn't, if it, if it would have been another black man in the street in North Carolina here, uh, he's referring to Jonathan Farrell. Uh, he's dead. If it's another black man sitting in handcuffs, he's dead, right? So again, we can catalog these number of things uh, and sitting in handcuffs is, is, is in alluding to Oscar Grant in the San Francisco uh, area, Oakland. Uh, they were victims because of the self-perceived perceptions of these black men that no matter what, they were going to kill these black men, right? So a decision had already been made that if I have a particular interaction or a particular type of interaction with uh, a black man, if I deem a black man out of place, as was the case for Jonathan Farrell in North Carolina, who had uh, had a car accident, knocked on a door, asked for help. The uh, police were called, but the police were told that, you know, this black man, it's, you know, potentially a threat, uh, et cetera. Of course, he's discombobulated. Uh, the police show up. Jonathan Farrell, you know, very likely believes that they were there to help him. Um, he shot and killed in the street. Right. Um, I can also think about Charles uh, Kinsey. I'm not sure. If, I want to mention a few other names because um, I'm not, you know, uh, sure that folks understand that there are some that are high profile, and then there's others that we don't hear about, uh, and not all of them have to be fatal. So Charles Kinsey uh, is uh, a medical worker, and he actually, this is North Miami, Florida, working with uh, a, a, a patient of his who was autistic and trying to help them. Uh, police show up. Now, order him down to the ground. Police officer orders him down to the ground. 
Charles Kinsey is laying on the ground with his hands up, no movement, no threat of action. The police officer shoots him in the leg anyway. In the aftermath, Charles Kinsey asks the police officer, why did you shoot me? And the police officer says, I don't know. All right. So when I think about what Mason is offering here, uh, is this uh, appetite for uh, what, what Ta-Nehisi Coates talks about, you know, in, in, in the United States and America, it is heritage to destroy the black body. Um, so you don't even have to think about it. Um, it could be the uh, reactionary response to the appearance, the presence, the out of placeness, uh, the non-belonging and the uh, non-being uh, of black boys and men. So again, just to finish up here, Mason says, I don't think that it's gonna change because that's their perception, no matter who we are as black men, it doesn't matter if we're wearing a hoodie or if we're in handcuffs, it's, it's simply because we're black men. Again, he's talking about um, how he's, you know, black boys and men are treated within larger society. And then here's another quick quote, uh, quote from Jeff. It says, I'm proud to be a young black male in the United States, but at the same time, I'm kind of reminded of W.B. Du Bois' point, quote, how does it feel to be a problem? I know it's just as a black man in America, me being a black man, pretty much everywhere I go, people are gonna be looking at me as a criminal or looking like I don't belong. So I know that I'm gonna be criminalized until we have some serious conversations about race, and I might still be. As a black man in this country, I know that somebody's thinking that I don't belong or that I'm a criminal or a thug or an athlete, right? And so here, again, we think about combining what Jeff offers, what Mason offers and kind of this larger picture that I'm painting. Uh, these stakes that they are trying to you know, make sense of and trying to navigate in many regards are very high stakes uh, to the extent that in some cases it may be you know, life or death, or it may be punishment and consequence, or it may be policing and surveillance, or it may be you know, any number of you know, different scenarios where they are troubled and challenged and uh, basically trying to assert their humanity in the hope that it might be considered in some way. Uh, here is another scene. This is, of course, not a movie. This is from the series, The Wire. I, I still watch this, even though it hasn't uh, shown in about 12 years. Uh, but this is from season four uh, with the four guys who were uh, in the school that that particular season focused on uh, black, you know, black youth in school. And it's centered on these uh, black boys here, uh, Randy, my, uh, sorry, Duquan, Randy, Michael, and Naaman. Uh, and I really want to use this image because uh, there are particular ways, as I mentioned, that school can be a site of suffering, um, where you could be in institutions, social institutions, where you are to be cared for, but you can be invisible, you can be marginalized, you can be deemed and considered as unworthy. Uh, and so this uh, particular school scene, for me, helps set this stage for even how uh, black boys who can all be from the same neighborhood can really be on different paths, depending on a number of different elements that they are both confronted with um, and invited into. I've got a couple more uh, school scenes here. And so this is another kind of uh, iconic movie juice uh, with uh, Bishop, uh, the characters Bishop and Q here played by Tupac and, and Omar Epps. Uh, and this is particularly Im important because, again, depending on kind of neighborhood dynamics, culture, et cetera, there may be ways in which people who are friends, uh, who have really close bonds and associations, begin to drift apart because of a series of a set of choices and decisions. And so part of the stakes that I argue that uh, Black boys and men are trying to navigate is, you know, not only these kind of wider society perceptions of them, but uh, how do we maintain who we are in the face of uh, changes in considerations to how people see us, view us, and their particular interests. Uh, one more uh, school scene here uh, is from the movie Finding Forrester, and this is uh, the, the main teacher in the film, Mr. Crawford, uh, and I'm showing his picture as opposed to Jamal's picture uh, because this particular scene resonates with this kind of larger corpus of data. Uh, I'm thinking about folks like William Smith um, and several others who talk about uh, this notions of black misandry and the ways in which black boys and men have to always prove themselves to others to be considered as worthy. Um, and in this particular scene, uh, or in the earlier scene, uh, Jamal was being schooled by a classmate that, you know, you don't, you don't ask teachers questions, just whatever the teacher says goes. So really thinking about this kind of unilateral uh, form of education, uh, which would, of course, fly in the face of what, you know, Bell Hooks talks about teaching to transgress and teaching to the souls 
of our students or creating uh, schooling as a, as a home place. So creating parts of our school as a home place where folks feel cared for in this particular case, because Jamal did not cater to the particular ethos of this school and this specific teacher, uh, he was rendered as unwelcome. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, a number of different scenes that I could have pulled from this film, but I, I, Mr. Crawford kind of offers this notion of the ways in which we've got to prove ourselves. And even when we do, we can still be condemned and marginalized. And then my final kind of school scene, if you will, I'm just taking it up to higher education um, and thinking about the ways in which we navigate the stakes. And this is a, another kind of uh, iconic film, Higher Learning. Uh, where, uh, you know, there's a, re, you know, there's a ream of different things that happen during these, these college years that are represented. Uh, and in this particular scene, what I'm looking at is how do we navigate those stakes um, in dealing with racism on campus and dealing with racial animus, uh, dealing with hostilities, uh, being repositioned as an outsider as a, and as a perpetual guest, and this particular scene for me helps to represent the importance of these micro communities and strong peer relationships. But then also the faculty teacher um, or student teacher, not faculty teacher, student teacher relationships with student faculty relationships that clearly plays a significant role in how black, black men in higher education, black young men, black men might be able to navigate it a bit smoother if they're embedded in communities where there is a kind of critical axis of care. And so uh, I evoke or use this particular scene to really kind of bring that point to light. Part of this resonates with some of my work with uh, black male initiative programs or black male micro communities on campus and the ways in which uh, these uh, culturally engaging spaces help contribute to different ways of knowing. So navigating the stakes, I got two quotes here that I want to share. I'm talking to these guys about, uh, you know, how, you know, what what was it that kept you motivated? What was it that you know helped you get through some of the challenges that you faced? And here's Julius. He says, <clears throat> "Excuse me, I'm resilient. I don't quit, uh, which could be a good thing or a bad thing in some scenarios. I mean, it could be a good to quit and start it all over, but I don't quit. I'm a thinker, planner, and when I don't." When I think about college, every time I didn't think and I didn't plan, it didn't turn out well for me, you know, kind of laughed in reflection. So I'm, I'm going to think and I'm going to plan so that I can have better results than when I don't. I realize that I make a lot of mistakes and I'm not perfect. And so part of uh, what I want to argue is critically important about navigating the stakes is for our Black boys and young men, you know, as I talked about even in a previous slide, you know, there's one component of that is building community, that's peer associations, as well as with, you know, adults who might play a range of different roles. Um, some of these can include, you know, there's a hyper focus on role models. I, I think we can uh, kind of, you know, dissect that a bit further, but we can think about fictive kinships, we can think about father figures, we can think about mentors and guides, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a number of different ways in which they can be supported. Uh, but in Julia's particular point, um, and the next point I'm going to raise as well, uh, this is about how these young men might reflect themselves and think about their own agency, right? So what is it that I've done in my experiences that I can take stock of, that I can activate um, as I move forward that might help yield different or better results? Um, here's Edwin uh, sharing as well. I learned that I had to get better. I had to better myself. I think I allow myself to put others before me and I allow myself to let others hurt me mentally and emotionally, that if I didn't learn how to deal with that, then I probably wouldn't be where I am now. So I believe that be, I became strong-minded. I believe that when it came down to, excuse me, what my heart says and my mind does, and they kind of go hand in hand, I didn't allow people to change me for who they wanted me to be, right? And so one of the profound lessons that in this project, the same project on, uh, the racial profile and stereotyping and the killing of black boys and men. One of the critical findings as uh, I talked to these men that I interviewed is 49 and all uh, about what would be some of the things that they would share with youth. Uh, what Edwin says here is one of those things that uh, the men in that this other study talked about, and that is stay true to yourself. And one of the ways that you can stay true to yourself is kind of as Julius and Edwin are sharing here is you got to learn who you are um, and uh, don't allow people to change me for who they want to be. And of course, here I'm thinking about uh, Sister Audrey Lord, you know, if uh, talking about how we think about ourselves, how we perceive ourselves. You know, if I don't define myself for myself, I'll be 
you know, eaten up by other people's fantasies of me. So I return to Chiron again, uh, just to kind of set the stage for these kind of last two pivot points. <clears throat> and here I'm going with the last black man of uh, the last black man in San Francisco. Um, and this is a particularly, uh, you know, in incredibly important scene in, in my view, at least. Uh, here's Jamie and Montgomery uh, really talking about digging into that sense of self. So again, I'm uh, tapping into ways in which uh, black boys and men really begin to develop, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, explore and pursue their sense of self, right? Who, who am I? How do I make sense of who I am in this world? And then what are the types of strategies that I might develop in order to, to navigate this? So uh, I'm thinking about Montgomery and Jimmy here in these kind of critical moments, being at the dock, uh, really interrogating uh, what does it mean for me to be a Black male in a particular place that is changing all around me uh, that may not really uh, appreciate me in ways in terms of who I am? This includes folks in the community across different race and ethnic backgrounds, if you've seen this film. Uh, but then also, uh, how do I get settled with myself? And this is uh, kind of the last scene that I'm offering here. Um, and of course, uh, for those folks who might've seen the movie Dope, uh, this is from that movie. This is Malcolm, uh, one of the main characters in the film along with uh, two other friends. Um, and I use this particular image uh, here to show Malcolm laying in his bed. And one of the plots in the movie, one of the storylines I should say is Malcolm's aspirations for college and in particular, Harvard University. Uh, for me, I wanna use this scene to, to make it even broader. I'm thinking about some work that I'm doing with my colleagues, uh, Jaleesa Clark and Keisha Wynn, and we're talking about uh, Black boys' possibilities. Um, and so what is the space that we might allow for Black boy dreaming, uh, for them to think about and imagine, right, this imaginative play, uh, this dream world, uh, or it's not necessarily a world, right, this being able to uh, elicit their dreams about what's possible for them in their lives, so thinking about their future selves, thinking about their possible selves, and so for me, I use this image to really kind of bring that point to the front. So again, thinking about where I started with Chiron and the ways in which Black boy and Black boyhood uh, might even be caged, uh, limited, constrained. Uh, again, I could think about Invisible Man. I could think about, uh, you know, Ralph Ellison's work, Invisible Man. Uh, I could think about works such as Black Boy by Richard Wright. Uh, what are the ways in which that we, we create opportunities and create spaces for Black boys and men to dream and fantasize about who they are and who they can be or what they might want to pursue or what they might be interested in? Um, I argue that this is a critical part of navigating mistakes, um, that we have to be able to see ourselves beyond the particular conditions that we might be uh, you know, constrained by or trying to make sense of or trying to negotiate, uh, we have to be able to see ourselves beyond those particular, uh, that particular setting, uh, because then that could tap into some of our desires, aspirations, motivations uh, to help us move forward. So I'll bring a conclusion here uh, with a few critical points and I'll wrap up. Uh, talking to Michael about, you know, what it's like to be a black man. You know, it's not easy laughing in frustration, kind of looking at me like, you know what it's like, you're a black man. You, 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 you know, this, this seems to be a rhetorical question, um, but he continues, you know, it's not easy at all being a black male. Sometimes you're a statistic, sometimes you're a murder rate, sometimes you're lost, sometimes you're blind. Sometimes the odds are just stacked against you just to see how willing you are to go through the obstacles. Uh, and this is, you know, a handful here. Um, I've got a few kind of critical takeaway points. You know, black boys and men have experiential knowledges, plural, that can help us better understand and appreciate their situated standpoints, meaning making, cultural knowledges, and cultural wealth. Black boys and men's educational experiences and lives provide, provide powerful narratives about their educational agency, their motivation, aspirations, self-authorship, resilience, right, their ability to bounce back. Uh, the, narr you know, the narratives of Black boys and men's lives certify that failure, challenge, and struggle are not conclusive, right? Uh, they're not conclusive. Uh, so just because they've struggled in another particular, you know, time period or season in their lives is not overly deterministic, as we've heard from uh, a few voices that I've shared here today. 
Uh, and then as we think about kind of black male success uh, should be heard, measured and understood through the lens of their efforts and their own meanings. So we should not subscribe to, um, I made reference to the last black man in San Francisco. I'm thinking about Jimmy and Montgomery. We should not subscribe them to everybody else's expectations of who they are and who they should be, uh, but instead uh, invest more time and energy in thinking about who they are and how they make sense of themselves. Uh, this is my, my last image here, some photographs by uh, this artist, E.J. Brown. Um, and here you see six black men in cap and gown, uh, but also holding a placard uh, that would be suggestive of uh, when you are you know, taken into custody to be detained in the police center. And so uh, E.J. Brown's artwork, this particular artwork uh, that I'm really fascinated by, is in some ways contesting the narratives, right? Uh, what Anthony Brown talks about is the same old narratives of black male failure, or we, you know, or even going all the way back to one of the earlier points I shared with Chris, where you know th this transit employee suggested that he would, you know, be hanging out on a corner or in gangs, that therefore his life is unworthy, is disposable, et cetera. Um, and so these images kind of help uh, really push those boundaries in ways of challenging the expectations, uh, the dominant narratives, the same old stories about Black boys, men. Uh, and what I argue, as I mentioned, is that we need to pay uh, attention to their possibilities. Thank you all so much. I look forward to our Q&A. Uh, thank you for allowing me to share with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brooms, man. I appreciate your perspective. I always appreciate you sharing. I know this work is you know, deeply personal to us both. So really appreciate it. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah, of course. We're going to take a, about an eight minute break and we'll be back at 11 okay. to start the Q&A with Dr. Brooms. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. We are back. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Brooms? Ooh, we actually have a couple. On the um, on our chat, so I'll read the first one, Dr. Brooms, for you. Okay. How do we mandate teachers to be required to be trained in cultural responsiveness, so they do not continue to label boisterous kids as a problem and stop the education to prison pipeline? Thank you for this question. I I, I think there's something really. Uh, well, two things. Number one is the question from. Uh, Ross here, I'm, I'm going to use the last name because I don't want to mispronounce uh, anyone's first name, uh, anyone's name. Uh, I, I think the question, first of all, highlights the very real ways that youth in many of our schools are challenged. And in this particular question, you know, we could talk about boisterous kids. Uh, and one of the things I immediately thought of, even though my presentation was about black, black boys and men, I immediately thought of black girls, right? What are the ways in which uh, even Black girls' uh, speech patterns and auditory patterns are labeled and surveilled in school, right? Often called loud, uh, often called angry, uh, and then are set up for, you know, all manner of consequences, et cetera. We can think about um, Latino, uh, Latinx girls as well. Um, so I, I think that's something that, you know, again, not only resonates with kind of the population that I was speaking about, but even a broader uh, population as well. Uh, so I, 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 I chuckled a little bit because uh, I'm just thinking about, you know, the theme for this year's uh, Unity Through Diversity Week, right? I'm just thinking about the theme. And the theme is lean on me embracing humanity as a radical act of resistance, right? And so to the question, uh, how do we mandate it? Uh, number one, I think it's fascinating that uh, we had to ask people or even try to mandate that people treat other folks with some human dignity and respect. So I think the question highlights a significant tension within the educational arena where, uh, you know, even as I talked about this, uh, thinking about Michael, G., uh, Michael Dumas's work, he talks about schooling as a site of Black suffering, right? Um, and so wh why is it that too many, you know, so many of our students suffer in schools. And a lot of that has to do with interpersonal interactions, as well as policy, excuse me, policies and practices that folks engage in. So, you know, the, do, do, should we mandate it? 
I know that was not the question. I'm just I'm just tweaking the question a little bit. Um, I think when we talk about the way people are treated in schools, uh, it continues to reveal to us that school success is not intended for everybody. And if that's the case, um, we need to have some very real, you know, honest dialogues about who we are and who we claim to be. Um, and as again, going to that last portion of the question, you know, the school of prison pipeline, I have some colleagues like uh, 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 Dr. Nathan um, um, uh, Bryan, who talks about the play guard to prison pipeline, right? Because again, you can be uh, problematized in your play. So you can be boisterous, you know, you can be loud in a school setting, you can, you can be on the playground and just, you know, I'm thinking about the young boy, I, I can't think of his name, but he was in a staring, playing the staring game with another young child uh, and basically got these, you know, ex, you know, it's not expelled, but suspended from school, detention, et cetera, because it quote unquote hurt the other person's feelings. So anyway, I'm, 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 I'm just thinking of multiple examples of the ways in which we don't respect and honor uh, people's humanity and in particular young people. Uh, we don't appreciate the different uh, ways of being and, and, and cultural knowledges that folks bring into the building or into our educational spaces, not always just the building. Uh, so, you know, mandating could be something we consider, but of course we're gonna get resistance to that. Um, and I'm, I, I don't care if folks resist it, but I think that if, when we have to mandate that we treat other people with respect, I think it shows the, the uh, lack of care that is embedded within our educational system as well. So uh, I'm, I'm a little bit, I, not that I don't have responses, it's, it's just frustrating to think about how our kids can be abused in schools. Again, I, you know, there's, there's a various ways that our, our kids are violated in schools um, that contribute to their underperformance, their lack of opportunities, their lack of access to resources, et cetera. Um, and we really need to uh, be much better and committed to what I, what I love to see is uh, a mandate of a humanizing pedagogy where we understand that, you know, you don't just teach a subject, you teach people. So if we're teaching people, first and foremost, we need to treat them as people who are, uh, you know, requires requires us to to really engage in you know a humanizing pedagogy so thank you for that question thank you dr burns all right we have another one that's kind of a statement in the question that says i appreciate your use of popular media to help us see and imagine the world you are talking about your last point regarding black boys and men's imagined lives and futures is so interesting too what are specific tactics that faculty and other educators can use to invite and cultivate the kinds of imagination you're talking about? Or if, this, if that's not our role, what role do faculty educators at a community college slash university level play in cultivating that imagination? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna thank you for that question. And this is something, like I mentioned, that my colleagues, uh, Jaleesa Clark and Keisha Wynn now, we've been you know, doing this, uh, working on this for, uh, I think maybe about a year and a half now, we've been thinking about these different things. And so one of the things we, we talk about is that what we, what we really need to curb is uh, people who position themselves as what we call dream killers, right? So that a young person, black boy, black man in particular, uh, shares their aspirations and what it is they think they want to pursue. And off the jump, we don't see them as an individual. We turn to statistics and probabilities and correlations and say, I just don't think you're gonna be able to do that because there's so many people who are trying to do it or very few people are able to accomplish that. And so in what ways might we be dream keepers, right? So that if I'm coming to you sharing about, uh, here's this particular type of desire that I have, here's this, uh, again, I'm thinking about this uh, very specifically through the lens of a particular type of goal that they're trying to reach or pursue. Uh, we, we kill the dream before they even get to take a step into it. So, uh, so when I think about what are some things we can do to cultivate it, number one is make, number one is build relationships. I'm, I'm, I'm a fundamental believer that, uh, you know, if we're gonna support people holistically, it has to through, be through uh, these very real tangible uh, ways of care and caring for them and caring about them. 
um, so that they even believe and feel that they have space to share out what it is they might be imagining, dreaming, et cetera. Um, and sometimes it can be difficult and in the post-secondary realm because we don't always know what some of those experiences are leading up to that. Uh, so that in some ways, you know, for some of our youth, by the time they make it to college, they may be a little bit more hesitant. Um, so what I would, you know, the first thing I would say is build a relationship. The second thing I would say is uh, create and sustain open lines of communication so that you can have these very real, uh, robust conversations about life, not just about school. Our students are not just their academic selves. Um, you know, too many black boys and men get pigeonholed into particular types of roles, as we saw in one of the quotes, uh, you know, if you're, an, you know, desiring to be an entertainer or perhaps uh, an athlete, and, and that's a little bit dicey too, depending on who you are. Uh, those are two lanes that we can, you know, we get a lot of support for, but in another, you know, a number of other realms, we don't get that same type of support. Um, so I, I think about the, the, the you know, the, the village and community approach that if we work in an educational setting, then all of us are responsible for everybody who's there, right? And so therefore, um, we need to be contributors to a particular type of environment that allows our students to not only thrive academically, uh, but to feel safe, to feel cared for, to feel nurtured, to feel supported, and to continue to become who they are, right? Because none of us are fixed products, um, and we should not treat our young people in those ways either. So, uh, and so just I'm just kind of talking about that part of the question. You know, if this is not our role, um, everybody has the opportunity to contribute in that way. It may be more likely that there's one or two or a small number of people who might be doing it. For instance, I might, uh, you know, have built a relationship with Doris, you know, through her role in the Multicultural Student Affairs or Professor Bryce, Dr. Bryce. And so those may be two people that I connect with and I'm sharing with them, but it also can be supported and facilitated by others as well. So uh, I think all of us can play a critical role in supporting, you know, this kind of holistic perspective of our young people that then also means uh, allowing them to, to dream, allowing them to imagine. It could be, if you work in the classroom setting, it could be about the type of assignments, right? Are we giving, a, are we providing students with assignments that allows them to evoke their own agency, right? Their own sense of self. Um, and, you know, how might we be creative with that? Again, I know different classes, we have to accomplish different things. Um, if, we, if we work, you know, on staff and we're working with students, you know, both formally and or informally, Maybe I'm a, a you know, advisor for a particular student group, or maybe I connect with you know, particular student associations, et cetera, student organizations. Uh, how might I bring that or support their aspirations and goals and dreaming in those kinds of ways? Uh, so I think we can think about that from a multi-pronged approach. Thank you for that question, Ian. All right, we have another one that says, how can we provide resources for black men who are immigrants who don't speak English? Yeah, thank you for that question, uh, Mahat. I think that number one is that, especially in educational settings, uh, you know, we need to tap into the resources that are there. I'm thinking about uh, English, you know, English as a second language, the ESL uh, resources. I'm thinking about uh, instructional resources. I'm thinking about uh, staff support resources so there, you know, in my view, there ought to be multiple resources on campus to support students. I know that each of the institutions I've been affiliated with, there are particular types of resources available on campuses um, that can support students who may not have English as a first language. And some of those could be class-based where they take, you know, some introductory classes. Uh, but then even beyond, I think there are some ways in which, uh, there could be resources within the community. So again, if I work at a particular community, excuse me, if I work in a particular educational institution um, and I've kind of come across seen or seen uh, or know that uh, we have a number of interested folks, interested people who might want to transition to our institution, uh, but language, English language becomes, a, you know, is a barrier, um, then I need to continue to, because again, I think this should have been happening anyway. I think we need to continue to develop critical and strategic relationships with community agencies uh, so that we can develop some partnerships to collaborate 
um, through a collective effort to support folks who might want to pursue education. Uh, you know, obviously I'm giving this talk at Highline and Highline being a uh, college invested in the community, uh, it would make sense to me that these are types of ventures that you know, I know that are already in place. Uh, and so we might need to seek out uh, those particular entities uh, or, or institutions or organizations that have those resources and continue to build relationships both within those particular spaces, but then across also across spaces as well. So those would be the, the main ways that I think about supporting uh, who, you know, those folks who might be racialized as black um, or be of African descent, uh, where, you know, English clearly is not their first language or they don't speak English fluently or well enough in ways to try to navigate an institution is uh, we need to make sure that we make those resources not only available, but also known so that not only those individuals, but folks in the community can know about them and share with others as well. Thanks for that, Dr. Burns. Yes. All right, we have a good sociological question, a structural you know, okay. one. Okay. How do we even approach breaking this cycle when it is embedded in the DNA of this country? So, yeah, so by, by this cycle, I'm going to uh, try to do a correlation that I think is connected to the, you know, denigrating ways, if you will, that Black, you know, boys and men are positioned and repositioned within our society. Um, so I think I, that, I, that's where I'm kind of, that's where I'm, that's where I'm seeing that question generated from. Um, so how do we break that cycle? I think that's multi-pronged. Uh, I think it's multi-pronged. So number one is we need to, we need to build, you know, continue to build and sustain strong communities um, because what we don't want to do is approach this from an individual, you know, again, given the question and given the larger point, right? Regardless, even if the question had honed in on this, but given the larger point that uh, no one individual can really alleviate and solve these structural problems. And in fact, uh, we have to be very careful, as, you know, in our teaching and support of young people, young, you know, black boys and young men, is to not teach them to buy into the ways in which uh, this country really engages and endorses exceptionalism, right? And so, what we know that this country does is we'll point to someone who has achieved in whatever particular venue, arena, et cetera, and then we point to them as the, you know, who we all ought to subscribe to be like. Uh, we can't let, you know, folks put one individual on a pedestal and then, you know, both request and demand that all of us uh, try to you know, pursue in the same kind of ways as that particular individual. So, you know, one of the things we have to do is as a community, we have to support folks in their multiple aspirations and motivations, um, not just in a singular venue. Uh, and I think that another critical thing that we have to do, and, and in fact, for me, uh, the question, you know, in, in a lot of ways resonates with my work and resonates with the research that I do. And part of the reason why I got engaged in some of this work is simply because I knew through my own personal lived experience, not just my life, but I'm talking about folks that I knew and I had come in contact with or friends, associations, et cetera, uh, that the narratives and the stories that were told about Black boys and men uh, were just one story. It was not the quote unquote, the story, but they were presented as the story. And so how do we kind of break that cycle is we have to use our voices and our own stories. And this is why I didn't just talk about me. I wanted to bring you all and present to you all in this work, voices from some of the you know, boys and men that I've talked to in you know, my research work or in, in you know, these folks I have relationships with. So, I mean, that would be another way is that we need to make sure that our voices are, are, are spoken and heard, uh, orally, written, et cetera. And then I think another thing that, <laughs> You know, what history tells us, and again, I'm thinking about this long history, is uh, we need to create our own entities so that in our own venue so that we can get our things out in the ways that we want to get them out. So again, when we have to try to put them on other people's platforms and get other people's approval or other people's investment, uh, that sometimes can change the way that, you know, uh, the end product looks. And so we have to be, uh, you know, creative, but then also uh, 
investing in our own ways of kind of getting our messages out, getting our, our, our words out, et cetera. And I can, I can mushroom that, right? That could be business related, that could be school related, that could be uh, community related, uh, that could be media related. So again, because this is, this is a multi-pronged uh, constraining, I think we need a multi-pronged approach. I'm thinking about, you know, Fred Hampton. It's, we don't need one particular way to, uh, you know, respond to a particular problem. We need multiple ways. Uh, and so I think about, you know, Fred Hampton, you know, where there's people, there's power. So uh, I think that's an opportunity, you know, a way in which we chip away. We might not break it all at once, uh, but we might chip away at uh, these constraints and these, you know, this, you know, dominant cycle. Uh, but I also think another way is that we have to we have to teach our youth. Uh, I'm thinking about you know Malcolm X. Only a, only a fool will let the enemy teach their children, right? So we have to understand that school you know learning happens all the time, and we have to be uh, intentional in ensuring that our young people are learning about themselves from people like them, from folks who are invested in them, from folks who care about them um, in holistic ways, so they can learn not only who they are but also who they can be. Thank you. Appreciate that, Dr. Burns. Yeah, it reminds me of, you know, the all the trouble we had trying to get our piece public, you know, bring the noise, you know, when we were trying to tell our stories as black male educators and got a bunch of pushback on, you know, trying to make it a theoretical piece. And, and not only did we get pushback, I think we I think that piece got rejected from six different journals. And in two of those journals, we had gotten communication that it had been accepted only the next day or a few days later. A, a next communication was, oh, I actually is not accepted. Like what, what happened since yesterday when you told us that it was accepted? So, uh, so our persistence, right, has to be part of that. And, and I think that's part of our larger uh, kind of story is that just because we get one no or two no's or three no's, that doesn't mean that we can't move forward. We just got to find the right venue to get our work out. Yep, yep. All right, reflecting on the work you do, have you seen a felt transformation within your world or spaces you inhabit? Uh, this is a, a super dope question. Absolutely. I mean, I, I can't, I can't be the same. I can't be the same knowing what I know now, uh, and, you know, and, you know, learning each year, if you will, and, uh, you know, each month, each season um, from the folks that I've worked with and connected with. Uh, and by work, I'm thinking about students and young people in school, educational settings, in community. I'm thinking about colleagues and friends, as I mentioned, Dr. Bryce, uh, Doris. I can think about like Josh Melangalis. I can think about, uh, I saw uh, uh, Loyal uh, was on earlier as well. Uh, so when I think about the, the ways in which I get situated and the supports that I receive, um, uh, the, the ways in which I learn through other people from other people, through other people, uh, it has fundamentally been transformative in even how I, you know, not only how I talk about the work that I do, but how I engage in the work that I do and what it is I'm trying to accomplish in my work. Uh, what I appreciate is so much of the alignment, at, you know, with the folks' names. That's just a few names because I know uh, connections uh, here, you know, from folks in the audience. So when I think about those folks who I'm connected with and connected to, when I think about the learning that I've done and, you know, literally not just me, but others, uh, it has absolutely been transformative because there's no way that, you know, I think about, I mentioned, I think I mentioned Jaleesa's Clark name a couple of times, like even working with Jaleesa, she was a grad student, now a professor, there's no way that I can, I could have done some of the work that I've been doing without learning, literally learning from folks like Dr. Jaleesa Clark. Um, so to, you know, as, as Audre Lorde says, right, that, that my liberation is in my community, right? Without community, there can be no liberation. And so therefore, when I think about that transformation, I think about my own growth. Um, I think about the ways in which I uh, have heightened, heightened my aspirations. Um, so in the work that I do and, and the work that I do with the people I do the work with, uh, absolutely 100% has been transformative. Um, and serves as inspiration, admiration, and motivation. Uh, uh, so in many ways, you know, from an indefatigable point, uh, you, know, you know, can't stop, won't stop. This is, this is the work uh, because I've seen the power that it's had in my life and I've seen the power that it's had in some other people's lives that, uh, that I'm connected to. Like, you know, I'm thinking about Devin Jackson. I'm thinking about uh, Aaron Gentry. Thinking about Chad Caldwell. Uh, thinking about, you know, folks like Darion Blaylock. 
And I'm just mentioning a, a, a few names, uh, Joe Goodman and some others uh, who I've worked with, where it's, it's uh, yeah, absolutely has been transformative. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, we have a comment. It says, thank you for introducing me to EJ Brown mugshot series. I also read this image as a double entendre of student debt amongst black students. Mm. Wow, I, I mean, that's, I, I wanna do some writing just on the, the EJ Brown uh, series uh, and just that point about student debt. Uh, you know, I'm working on this piece on the cost of college and uh, I, I won't say too much about it because I got to develop it some more. Um, but but here's here's a here's a and I, I know that was a comment and I just really appreciate that comment and I'm raising it as a question and it's a bit rhetorical because I'm not trying to answer it right here. But uh, you know I talked about and, and I'm doing some writing on it. So probably why I'm not answering it as well. I'm trying to get my thoughts together. But yeah, you know, I talked about schooling as a side of black suffering. You know there are ways in which black boys at early preschool ages. Um, you think about Jawanza Kanjufu and his work about the fourth grade syndrome the ways in which they are problematized in school where, where teachers will say they care and, uh, you know, and fail them. Now, I'm not talking about grade fail. No, I'm not talking about grade fail. I'm talking about fail them as a, as a person on a daily basis, though they claim that they care. Uh, so I'm thinking about that. And so when I think about the student debt crisis, um, it's funny uh, to, that, to that kind of point, there's clearly this financial student debt, and particularly we think about places like four-year institutions and, excuse me, for-profit institutions and things like that. But I'm also thinking about student debt in the ways that Gloria Lassen Millen talks about the educational debt, right? So what is the debt that we owe to black students? So not amongst black students, but what is the, the debt we owe to black students that's stemming all the way back to um, Carter G. Woodson's um, work the miseducation of the Negro, that this, I would I argue that this schooling system, right, not an educational system, this schooling system is in large part uh, uh, centered on miseducating black folks, right? And we've seen that in policy, we've seen it in law and even some of the newer laws, and we've seen it in practice on an annual basis uh, where there is a lack of investment in teaching black folks about who they are. Um, that's not an accident, right? Uh, that's an investment in anti-blackness so when I think about student debt, uh, I think about the student debt to black students as well um, as the student debt among black students. So, so we have to ask the question of, given that so many black students, boys, girls, regardless of gender identities, expressions, et cetera, uh, black youth and, and black peoples, we have always been committed to education. We were committed to education before there were schools, right? Because we know that through law during enslavement, we were forbidden to read and write. So there's a particular uh, investment that black folks, uh, folks racialized as black have had in this country as it relates to education. Uh, again, not just going to school, but learning um, that there's a particular investment and interest and desire that black folks have had uh, in education that is regardless of schools, right? It is about who we are as a people um, and uh, you know, in our own place and time, but then also our elders and ancestors as well. So there are significant debts um, that I say that, that, uh, that are within you know, and across black communities, black families um, and across institutions. I, again, I know this question didn't ask about that. I can think about uh, Wilder's work about Ebony and I read and the, the slave labor that built many of these you know, quote unquote, elite institutions, right? So let's talk about the debt there. So uh, I, I, I don't know, I just took that question and thought about debt in multiple, in a multifaceted way, um, uh, because we also know, just going back to the particular statement, I, I shouldn't say question the statement, um, we also know that the for-profit colleges, you know, engage in predatory lending uh, that then contributes to, uh, you know, student loan debt crisis, et cetera. So uh, thank you for that statement. It really kind of, Push me a little bit there. Dr. Brooms, I would like to thank you, man. We can't thank you enough. Always a pleasure learning from, from you. Always a pleasure, you know, you sharing your time with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity to engage with the Highline community and all the folks who came out uh, earlier and who was able to stay for Q&A. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for this again to the Center for Culturally Inclusive Excellence to the team. 
uh, to the, you know, the Multicultural Student Affairs, to the Highline College community. Thank you all so much for inviting me out and allowing me to share both some of, you know, some of my work, but also some of my perspectives on the work that I do. Thank you so very much. Appreciate you. I'm gonna pass the mic on to Eweezy to close us out for Unity Week. Thank you, Dr. Rice. And thank you again, Dr. Brooms. Keep showing love, Highline, in the chat. Um, this concludes our Unity Week. It's really sad to say, but I mean, I feel like it's such a great way to take what Dr. Brooms has shared um, today and like how do we then apply it to our action steps and moving forward um, as a community. And so thank you again, Dr. Brooms. I'm just here just to share a few announcements. Um, thank you to everyone for joining all three, well, I guess four of our programs throughout this week. I hope that it's been um, a time of not just connecting with community, but really taking in what each of our speakers have brought um, to our team. And so um, if you're looking for more ways to continue to engage in dialogue um, here at the Center for Culture and Inclusive Excellence, we do have some ways that you can still um, connect with us students, staff, faculty. Um, next week, our service and mentorship engagement team um, will be kicking off our letters to community. And so thinking about ways, if you want to show gratitude or if you want to write things to folks that you know, come see the same team at um, here in Building 8. They are going to be in person tabling um, on those two days. And so come through, come say hi, um, as well as in the Intercultural Center, if you want to continue to talk and um, engage with some of our student peer facilitators, there are gonna be a few programs coming up in May. Um, you can email the team at icc at highland.edu um, or just come visit. The, the center is open um, mainly in the afternoons between Tuesday to Thursday, 12 to five. So come through, come say hi, let's chat some more. Let's unpack more of what um, Unity Week has taught us. Um, and then last but not least, here at the Center for Leadership and Service, um, students, we want to celebrate you. And so for folks who are going to get nominated, May 25th will be uh, Student Legacy Awards. It will also be our final say for all of our students who've been a part of the Connect program. Um, we want to celebrate you. And also a super early congratulations to folks who are graduating this year. Um, I know you'll get more details about commencement. Um, but thank you again, community, for being with us, holding space with us, um, and we hope to see you around virtually or in person. Take care, everyone. <laughs>